retired teacher and a emerging writer. And I'm going to read an excerpt from my new book. My first book was Missing Mama, My Story of Loss, Healing and Sorrow. And Sorrow Songs is a follow-up of that with voices from the community. My story is a crying child. I was a crying child. My feelings were visible, black feather wings on small, girly shoulders. I was always one onion away from some incorrigible display of despair. My eyes became poached with lids seared shut and tears streaming like Christmas tinsel. Grown-ups responded differently. I got fed. Candy found in the bottom of a Sunday best purse was pressed into my hand. I got petted. Sweet kissy aunties pulled me into breasts so big that the need for air superseded all emotions. <laughs> I got punished. Those caretakers saddled with my upbringing took offense. My crying was neither an appropriate expression of gratitude nor a recognition of their sacrifices. Sorry. What you got to be crying about, they asked. I'll give you something to cry about, they threatened and sometime made good on their promise. Too much crying was too much too close to not being right. On good days, I knew what I felt. Some feelings were mine. I knew fleeting happiness and peaceful minds at times, but more so I was sad. Why did I feel so bad? But how does a child speak about such a crushing, dark, forbidden feeling? How does a child speak about something not said? One day, sorrow spoke to me at church. It was during a very dull Sunday sermon. The pastor went on and on and on and on. The congregation was a hurdle of steaming bodies. The air was thick with clashing toilet waters, denture breaths, hard peppermints, and nasty little boys passing silent gas. <laughs> the trick to staying awake was to keep looking around for other kids to see if they were bored as me. Then Mrs. Ida Mae Blackwell, the oldest woman in the world, stood up. Mrs. Blackwell had to be 200 years old. She had a full head of silver bushy hair and a salt and pepper beard. Her eyes looked like marbles. She was blue black with skin so soft and finely wrinkled she glowed in the daytime. People whispered she was all African. She had a zillion kids, grandkids, great grandkids and others who said they were related to her. But in the middle of this sermon, she decided to have her say, I guess. All eyes turned as she willed her body to make each step. She walked determined to see the finish line. Then I saw it. I saw a deep, shape-shifting sadness, a perversive grief in her body, a feeling like mine resided in all her warm, moist places. It sat on the rim of her eyes. It nestled underneath her tongue. It coiled in the back of her throat. It was itchy hives inside her twisted guts. It sneered, tucked in her privates. It was in her anus as gatekeeper and would not let her expel some unsaid truths. But what truth, I thought. Then I heard it whisper, sorrow, sorrow, sorrow. Mrs. Blackwell got up to the front of the pew, climbed the steps, walked past the pastor, past the choir, and right up to the picture of Jesus hanging on the cross. She began talking to him in a language I had never heard before. Even those who spoke in tongues didn't understand what she said either. Then Mrs. Blackwell kicked off her heels and reached up underneath her dress and rolled down her stockings. These she pulled and flung. She snatched off her dress, her slip, followed by her bra and her panties. <laughs> then she began to dance. And as she moved, age or old Arthur, or maybe with some heavy burden, just fell off of her. She was young and spry and beautiful. She moved like a snake, like a black swan. She twirled, she leaped, she sang. And those words weren't understandable either. I was too surprised to look away. I don't think one grown-up held that against me. They were all gaping, too. We had no words for sharing what we witnessed. Mrs. Blackwell finished her dance. In silence, she stepped back into her clothes. She retraced her steps with a queenly vigor. She paused at me. You the carrier now, she whispered, and she kissed me right in the middle of my forehead. She continued down the aisle, past her seat, and out, into the, ch out the church. Mrs. Blackwell's passing was announced in the church bulletin the very next week. That was a standing room only Sunday. And now, 
I was a carrier. Mrs. Blackwell had laid the pain she carried for a long time in front of Jesus. She had laid down the pain of a hard life with little love and not much to show for her labors. She passed unto me an attachment of people that held hands across oceans. They came, whispered stories to me. I heard stories of ships overloaded with stinking, screaming men, women, and children who had gone mad before arrival. They told me stories of kidnappings and beatings and burnings and rapes and lynchings. I heard the cries of men unable to defend loved ones. I heard their rage at gods who were blind and silent and made them sour. Women told stories about bearing children that were, they were lucky to keep but could not save from lifetimes of bondage, beginning in cotton fields, sugarcane plantations, and spread to desolate, decaying urban cities. I heard the cries of their frightened, lonely, hungry, and lost children. I heard gunshots. I saw blood, sweat, and tears. One day they told me, place this sorrow on paper. Tell our stories, then we can lay our weapons on the ground, and no need for more carriers. There are some days where I feel nothing. I hear and see no more than anyone else. Then there's days when I write and cry. I'm Semilit Strawn, and my life, like all of our lives, have had these turning points, these crushing points, and this is the story of one of them, and how those points evolve and make us into who we are. This is motherland blood. There is a place on the sol haitien, the Haitian soil. There is a place on the Haitian soil where my blood was shed. In truth, there are many places, overlooked places. For example, where the placenta who had sustained me for eight months was more than likely thrown away, like a part of medical refuse, bloody garbage into the earth, since by 1952, science had already distanced us from our indigenous rituals, burial rites of sacred organs. There are, in truth, many places, overlooked places. For example, the blood from minor cuts, the blood from my menses, the blood from sores that returned year after year and festered and wept all down my legs, all these places where inconsequential amounts of my blood made their way pad by gauze, by band-aids, into the earth. And then there is this place, the place along the route nationale numéro un, the main national road leading out of the bustling, busy city of Port-au-Prince, loud with the cacophonous, bleeding sound of klaxon, beep, horns leaned on by frustrated drivers, loud with the choking smell of exhaust fumes at overcrowded crossroads, a flat road speeding us towards clean air, wide spaces, and the whisper of breezes, a road alongside which there were coconut trees, seagulls, the crashing sound of waves upon distant rocks and sands and the smell of sugar cane burning and the shoreline speeding with us, teasingly allowing us to peek off again and on again at a sea indescribably blue. And when we swerve to avoid the man with the impossibly high and heavy load of sugar cane on his back, it was no one's fault that the car tumbled off the road. No one's fault that there was deep pain, agonizingly shocking pain, and a major spilling of the blood of my right hand. No one's fault that there was a smashing, a pulverizing, a breakup of the well-ordered architecture of that organ of will, organ of action and mastery, and it was reduced to a bloody pulp resembling hamburger meat. And this spot, this spot by the side of the road was reduced to a place of misfortune, a shame, an accident, 
a place that turned the former hand into something to overcome, some ugliness that I would have to accept and integrate, something later that I would not allow to stop me from going to medical school, something that only children have the honesty and ingenuity to ask outright, what happened to your hand? <laughs> and it took 31 years and the weight of life's many spills to lead me to where I am finally able to hear the true sound, the true sound of that place. It is a place you see along the route nationale numéro un, where the motherland of my birth called me, crushed me, pressed me into her bosom, mixed my blood with her earth, her dirt, her twigs, and her wax, and said, you, she said, you belong to me. Your blood and my sap are one. It has been so since the beginning of time. But that educated road that you're on, it would have you forget it. Unless this day I rise and claim you and make of our bloods one blood and make of this place the one place where you are rooted, the place where you can always come back and know the blood bond of our blood. Wow, I mean, I'm glad you're here because otherwise we could all go home. <laughs> um, thank you to the Witness Program, Amake and Samarit. Un unbelievable readings, and we really thank you for, for that and for coming here tonight. I have a request, and because I'm going to be a good executive director and not a bad mom, would you all please silence your cell phones so that as we, you know, as we move forward with the program, we aren't interrupted by them. I appreciate it. So, hello. My name's Heidi Barajas. I'm the executive director of UROC, and it is so wonderful to see you all here tonight. Um, I am always thrilled, and everybody hears this whenever we have an event, and what I say is, you know, I'm like that teenager that when you have a party, you're a little afraid people won't come, and you always do. So thank you for being here tonight. Um, we are here to welcome a lot of different participants to the Art for Healing, the role of creativity in trauma recovery. For you, Rock, this is the third in a series of public conversations about trauma and healing, something that we have dedicated ourselves to um, since this time last year when uh, the two daughters of Desmond Tutu came and worked with our communities, both the university and with our North Minneapolis community and other people who came to talk about how do we talk about trauma? How do we talk about things attached to trauma, mental health, both for, and for adults and for children. These are very difficult topics, and yet there is a need in all communities to have these conversations and in different ways. These critical conversations support UROC's mission to link the University of Minnesota and communities <coughs> together to solve urban issues. And so that is what we're doing here tonight. Our link with the community began with a wonderful partnership that has been so enjoyable with our great friends from KFAI. This critical conversation is presented as a special edition of KFAI's What's in the Mix, a community engagement forum made possible by a grant from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. So thank you, KFAI, very much. Before I introduce our remarkable moderator, who I can't believe we got, <laughs> but I'm going to keep it professional, um, I would like to acknowledge a few people in the audience. You're all important, um, and there, but there's some people who, who I do want to acknowledge. And I'd like to start with our colleagues from KFEI, uh, Willie Dean, the executive director, Janice Lane Ewart, and Nancy Sartor. And you've just been great partners. Thank you so much. From the University of Minnesota, we have a, a new visitor to UROC. I'm thrilled that Regent Laura Broad is here with us tonight. Thank you. And we found out that her dad worked with Mr. William English at the Control Data. So she already feels like family, and her mother and grandmother lived just up the road here in North Minneapolis. So I already feel like you're part of the family here. 
Um, Representative Joe Mullery, are you here tonight? Well, he was gonna be here and we're really glad that he said he would, even if he can't, isn't here at this moment. So thank you. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to tonight's moderator, Robin Robinson. And I'll have to tell you the truth, um, I was gonna do a very short introduction, but she had one of the best bios I've ever, ever seen and I'm just gonna read it to you. So, Ms. Robin Robinson, no money and no job, she stepped off a Greyhound bus and into a career not only as one of the first African Americans to anchor a primetime newscast, but as an icon of Twin Cities broadcasting. Her 20 years on air have been filled with numerous honors, including the Upper Midwest Emmy for Best Anchor, Broadcaster of the Year by the Minnesota Broadcasters Association, the Minneapolis NAACP Industry Award for Outstanding Contributions to Broadcasting, and the Mass Media Award for the National Conference of Christians and Jews. Her unwavering belief in the people of Minnesota led Robin to work hard in the community, becoming a Hubert H. Humphrey Public Policy Fellow at the University of Minnesota. She was also selected by Mayor R.T. Ryback as the first co-chair of Mosaic, the Citywide Arts and Diversity Festival in Minneapolis. Robin was owner and curator of Flatland, a contemporary fine art gallery featured in national publications including Art News, Travel and Leisure, and El Decor. Her, her curatorial skills won commissions from Northwest Delta Airlines and the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. A freelance writer, Robin's been published locally, nationally, and overseas. She's been featured for her art and music industry connections around the world, including interviews with BBC Radio and Billboard Magazine. Her personal art collection has been shown on national television and in museums. Not content to only collect, her own artwork has been exhibited in galleries and at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. Robin's also the creator and designer of Rocks Minneapolis Jewelry, uh, featured on the Tyra Banks Show and in local and national fashion and lifestyle publications such as Metro and Red Book. Rocks, R-O-X, is carried overseas across the U.S. and in Twin Cities jewelers and boutiques. She lectures on the global impact of design and philanthropy as well as the history of stones and Greek design and its influence on modern jewelry trends. Never one to be pigeonholed. That wasn't what I was thinking, actually. <laughs> Robin surprised her many fans by taking a sabbatical from television news, and do you remember this, and running for candidate for lieutenant governor of the state of Minnesota. At Intenza in his campaign to put a Democrat back in the state capitol's highest office. Her presence was an undeniable boost to the ticket and added to the allure of one of the Twin Cities' most electrifying personalities to date. Let us welcome Robin Robinson. It's all lies. It's all <laughs> lies. It makes me wonder what I've been doing. It's like, do I sleep? What kind of pills am I taking to get me through the day? Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad that everybody turned out for what is going to be a really fascinating evening, a stimulating evening, because we all know what this is about. Art heals, and we see it everywhere. It's on bumper stickers, and it's in our homes. It's on our desks, because we do know the impact of what the arts can do. And in that short interim that I stepped away from Channel 9 and tried to figure out what I was going to do with my life once I grew up, those three years of me making jewelry was the best therapy I've ever had in my life. It got me through some trauma, it got me through some tears, and it made me propel, just kept saying, I'm going to make this happen. And so luckily, next month, uh, the new line of rocks is going to be going national on the shopping network, and I'm just going to say that briefly, I'm really excited. Those three years of tears paid off, basically. So I'm excited in any conversation that we talk about art healing because we all know that we either know somebody or we have somebody in our families that everybody always said they're special. They stay to the self. They didn't talk much. You put the food plate on Thanksgiving at the door and left it there. Nobody really explained what was wrong with that person. But when they came out of their room with the creativity that they had, you knew that something was keeping them there, keeping them alive, keeping them sane, basically. Because art really does chase those demons away and explains for people what exactly is going on inside. So I'm really thrilled that we could be here today. Uh, I just want to do a little housekeeping and let everybody know that since
since KFAI is recording this event, you can get an archive of this 30-minute program. It'll be available at kfai.org slash miniculture for two weeks after our event here this evening. So make sure you speak to folks about how you can get a copy if you'd like to have it for your organization or for your workplace as well. And with that, let's get started with our incredible program. I want to introduce our panels. We're going to go from my immediate left across to the very end. Uh, Robin Getza, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist with an emphasis in, uh, emphasis in art therapy. Robin brings the healing modalities of art and yoga to her clients. Through workshops and individual sessions, her healing-focused work touches a variety of populations, including families who have lost children to gun violence, Robin is also owner of Momento, adornment for the home, home designs using image, word, color, texture, aromatherapy, and the power of memory. Wing Young Hui, who is a photographer and visual artist. Wing's work has been exhibited in museums nationally and internationally. He creates up to the minute societal mirrors of who we are, seeking to reveal not only what's hidden, but what's plainly visible and seldom noticed. Wing was named the 2000 Artist of the Year by the Minneapolis Star Tribune, and he's the author of five books, including the University Avenue Projects, Volume 1 and 2, Looking for Asian American and Ethnocentric Tour, Lake Street, USA, and Frogtown, Photographs and Conversations in an Urban Neighborhood. Next, we have Hoana Sullivan Jansen. Hoana is the Gallery Curator and Special Projects Coordinator at the University of Minnesota Urban Urban Research and Outreach Engagement Center, or UROC as we know it, where she manages the gallery and arts-related programming, including the Witness Creative Writing Workshop Series, the U.S. 5th Congressional District Arts Competition, and UROC's involvement in the John Bigger Seed Project. A poet and a 2013 Givens Foundation Creative Writing Program Fellow, Hoana also volunteers with the African, Minnesota African American Museum as the co-chair uh, of the African American Leadership Forum Ubuntu Council. And Catherine Kennedy, who was born in Liberia, Liberia, Catherine left her homeland in the early 1990s during the Liberian Civil War. Through documentary films and mixed media installation work, she examines her own experiences as a displaced person and explores the often difficult and painful paths that African refugee, refugees and immigrants to the United States face. Catherine says, when I make work based on these experiences, I feel a healing that goes on and feel that my work allows others to heal as well. Let's give a round of applause to our panel. <laughs> now what we're going to do is we're going to start with some readings from uh, um, uh, some opening remarks from um, our, our panel. And each person will speak for three to five minutes about their experience with art and healing. Uh, and then we'll go into a, a short panel discussion, and then we're going to turn the mic over to you guys to ask questions because that's really what the most important thing we're to hear from you. So let us begin with Robin. Thank you. I'm so honored to be here. I'm going to leave it at this image for uh, a minute here. Um, this is the only image you'll see of my work in the, in the collection of pictures I have here, but. Um, uh, my journey, basically, I've done art my whole life. My undergrad degree was interior design. I grew up, I was telling Wing, with a family of photographers. My father and brother are professional photographers. Um, and I've been surrounded by art my whole life. Um, so interior design was my undergrad. Then I um, had Momento, this business, which is basically taking home decor, beautiful objects for the home, silk pillows, and putting image digitally printed photographs and words together, poetry. Um, I did that after my third child was born for about um, 10 years. I still continue to do it as I have time. And during that time, I was doing many art residencies as an artist with combining art and social justice. So um, I was a McKnight recipient of a family housing fund that had 26, I believe, artists and poets creating art about um, affordable housing and homelessness. Um, I worked with homeless teens. I did a project at Gillette Children's Hospital with Takumba Aiken, who's one of my collaborators um, through my life. 
um, lots of different things like that uh, while I was doing my own art. And then um, I went through a life transition or transformation, as I call it, after being married for 18 years, found myself um, divorced, three kids, and having to kind of change my life. Um, I decided to go back to grad school for art therapy. So this imagery kind of happened right after I found out that I was going to be a single mom, and I, my imagery changed completely. There's many images, which I think is self-portraiture, but it, um, this is just one, and this is my business card um, that actually I created during an art and yoga workshop on the East Coast of my mentor who, um, or, oops, make a noise, but um, this book, Art and Yoga, Hari Kiran Kaur, she's on the East Coast, and she's been a mentor to me through this journey. Um, so that's my work, um, but the rest of the work I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, building this practice, um, uh, individual practice that I have working with all different communities with art therapy and healing arts. Oops, going backwards. Yep. So um, when I first started, I might have even still been in school. Um, and I should say, when I was at, at the Adler Graduate School, I, I had two internships. I had a two-year internship with Fairview Adolescent Day Treatment. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> my time is already. Um, and Pillsbury House. And then I got into this work through Art Start, working with uh, adults with uh, developmental disabilities. And this is a mural project that we ended up doing. Um, I work with uh, LifeWorks, some adults with developmental disabilities. And then there was an advocacy day. And on this advocacy day, everybody made a little house tree or person, and we put them together on that day. Everything was put together. It got to be really busy, but it was hundreds of people putting this together. So it was a beautiful thing. Um, another important moment in this whole thing was um, I was listening to radio, KMOJ, and um, Miss Georgia did a project, L2V, Lost to Violence. I heard it on the radio. And I just felt compelled to volunteer for this weekend of working with families at this um, retreat center called Faith's Lodge, which I continue to do work at. Um, but this particular weekend was uh, families who lost children to gun violence. And I was relatively new in my career, but I went for, um, uh, anyway, four days and did some amazing work. So this is these little boy's feet with some hearts. And this is a group project we can talk later about, but... Um, that the teens put together for the, the parents who had lost children. Um, it, one of the things that was beautiful was all these dates that were connected. You'd hear somebody's birthday was on a death date, was on somebody's grandmother's date, and we just ended up memorializing everybody this way. And then as a follow-up to that, we did the Northside Art Crawl and um, had a group called um, Two Mothers and um, I believe Youth Farm and um, Two Mothers is a group of moms who've lost children and these kids from Youth Farm. And we just did sidewalk chalk at the North Side Crawl. And these kids traced the mom's hands and wrote the dates again of their son's uh, deaths. And it was a great collaboration. That um, music wasn't at uh, the time, but it, yeah, your time is yeah, just about I know, it's coming time. in. So. <laughs> I do art and yoga. Again, we can talk more about that, but this I work with a, a place called Merrick uh, Developmental Disabilities, and um, do it, this woman's in a wheelchair and holding my hands, and we're doing what we can um, with yoga and music and movement. And if there's any more pictures, I'm sure we can come back to okay. and talk a little bit more during the rest of the discussion. Let's pass it over to Lena. Let's, can go through So I photograph uh, everyday life in neighborhoods. I've been a photographer for over 35 years. And I simply walk up to people on the streets and ask if I could photograph them. Um, sometimes a lot of my projects are geographically based. So for instance, my first project was in Frogtown. And so I would just say, I am a, I'd have all my camera gear. I would say I'm a professional photo photographer and I'm photographing everyday life in neighborhoods. This project was from Lake Street. Uh, and then this project was from the University Avenue project where I photographed for four years. So when I walk up and down the street, I'm just like everyone. I have my own deeply embedded biases and assumptions. Um, but I'm better to able to confront what's in my head when I have a camera around my neck. I'm always uh, surprised um, by what was in my head and, and then actually getting to know someone photographing them. 
with, with a lot of my projects, uh, I started off as kind of a documentary photographer. And I felt that uh, after uh, my university, well, during my University Avenue project, after photographing for 20 years, I thought, no matter how good the photograph is, you can't really see inside someone. So how do you get a photograph where you can get a glimpse of the inner self? I thought, well, I'll just use chalkboard. What, what, what questions would I ask? So I came up with a series of questions, questions like, what are you? How do you think other people see you? What don't they see? What advice would you give to a stranger? Oops. Let me go back here. Oops. And, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Oh, which way am I going? <laughs> I lost track here. But, there we go. So, with chalkboards, I felt that uh, having a conversation with people and asking them questions, then I would choose the answer that I thought was the most um, surprising and what told me about the person. And so I started to do this with um, students and with uh, people from all different audiences, corporate executives in middle school. And I would show them photographs, ask them what they see, to show that everyone has a different perspective. I like to take photographs that are very suggestive, but what they um, say is up to each person looking at them. And how much of how we look at photographs has to do with direct interaction, the people you see on a weekly basis. And how much does it have to do with all of the images that we've consumed in our lifetime, all the pop culture, pop culture images that we know are false in this age of Photoshop? And how much do they drive how we think of each other and ourselves? So often, say with students, we'll have the teacher pair them up with a student that they don't know, that they don't really talk to, and they ask each other the questions. I call this a chalk talk. And it's very difficult for students to have conversations with, with each other. Although it's harder to say which, which, which group is uh, more reluctant to be real and to reveal vulnerability about themselves, a corporate executive or a middle school student. Maybe the corporate executive. But in any case, people have a hard time doing it. And so, I really want to um, try to get people to have conversations. Basically, that's what I do. I have conversa conversations with people that I don't know. Um, for high school students, sometimes it's very difficult. There was one high school class, they were having a hard time having a conversation, a simple conversation. And I asked, why can't you do this? And one person said, well, you have to understand that on the battlefield, if you show your vulnerability to your enemy, they will kill you. I said, what battlefield are you talking about? He said, the battlefield of high school? He says, yes, there are casualties every day. I said, is that true? Do you think of everyone as a potential enemy? And most people nodded their head. I said, what if you thought of everyone as a potential friend? A couple of people, they laughed at me. That's ridiculous. That's unrealistic. So then a couple of people said, well, that'd be great. You walk down the hall, everyone says hi to you. So I think there is a, a lot of disconnection. I'm basically showing people how, how I do what I do. Thank you. Thank you. So I think I have an advantage here. I work for an organization that by design and from concept knew what it wanted to be. And so when people ask me why I'm in the arts, when people ask me why we do creative writing classes here, I tell them about the journey that we, UROC as an organization, went on and all the people that came along with us. So before we ever opened our doors, we had a series of community meetings where we invited people to come together and help us figure out what this place was going to be and what we were going to do. And there were several things that came out of that work that have guided us every single day that we unlock the door and how we're going to react when people ask us questions that are difficult and what we're going to say when someone says, how can I join in?
The very first project that we ever did was a commission with two local artists. One, a woman named Fazia Khan, who had been an OBGYN in the middle of her life, woke up one day and realized it wasn't what she wanted to do anymore, and went back to school at the University of Minnesota to become an artist. She worked with us at four and five-year-old children from Pika Head Start and did a series of workshops with them where they explored the idea of community. What is community? What's awesome about living in community? What is just wretched about having to live in community? And how we can figure out ways to move forward in the future with all of that knowledge, but with a better way of living. And it was a phenomenal display. It was then in the moment where we started to figure out what's the next level of this conversation. We invited the kids who had participated in the sessions with Fazia to come in with their parents and grandparents to a special exhibit that we hosted just for them. Because if you've ever been in an art gallery on opening night, you know it's not really the kind of place that most kids would flourish in. And what we saw was pretty incredible. We saw little tiny people looking at pictures of themselves on the wall and suddenly realizing how beautiful they were and how people cared about the stories that they had to tell. It was a transformational moment for our work. The next project was an opportunity to pair science and art. We worked with artist Lynn Fellman, who did DNA portraits, as she called them. Um, she did a project where each person got a little kit and they did a cheek swab that they sent into uh, the, the Human Origins Project. And in the mail, in about six weeks, they got a little slip of paper that told them where in the world there were people who had the most common DNA with them who considered themselves to be indigenous. Together with students from Juxtaposition Arts that did interviews of each of the people that participated in the project, Lynn helped to tell their story and then she did images of each person and superimposed the map that showed their ancestors' journey into North America. How I Met Wing. It can be our next mini-series. But we, those of you who may remember the tornado that hit the north side, it was devastating, not just in property loss and in loss of life, but it was devastating emotionally, in particular for the children of the north side. And so, with a group of folks from a couple of um, nonprofit organizations, we set out to help them to tell the story of surviving the tornado that had hit the north side. The project was called Of Sadness and Hope, and the children took photos of people from all over the neighborhood. And, and with Wing as one of their mentors, they used his Chalk Talk system and produced some pretty powerful images. My favorite one by far is the story of a woman who had just opened a beauty shop a few days before. And then the tornado hit, and she was pretty much out of business. The best thing about it is that when they asked her what it was that she wanted to say, she said, despite everything, she was determined and resilient. My favorite part was when the kids all came out with their families and we asked them how they were feeling. One student in particular said, this project made me change how I feel about people. That's why we're here. How we became writers? Um, Project Sweetie Pie was here. And we ran into them in the lobby one day and they said, well, I know you do art, but what can you do for us? And so I came up with the idea to teach a writing workshops for the kids that were in that workshop. And this is the poem that as a group we created. I am here for the money and the sun, and the chance to be with my best friend. I am here to watch, to tell the earth that we care. I am here to breathe the air unfiltered by machines. I am here to make something of myself, but not by myself. I am here. 
again, a transformational moment. And so when Nancy approached us about collaborating to create this series of writing workshops, we jumped at the chance. And you were able to hear the reading by two of the participants in that workshop. And I hope that you are as blown away as we have been by the stories that have come out of those sessions. Thank you. that I'm doing right now. She has died since 2010, but um, I still make work about her and her experiences. Um, she has, was part of a group, um, the Liberian uh, Dog Pop, that's what they call them, but um, they're, Bas they're from Bassa, and it's uh, from Liberia, West Africa, one of the uh, indigenous uh, dialects that are spoken there, and I speak it too. We say mwe, and then you can say e mwe. <laughs> but anyways, um, that's saying hello. So I'm greeting you mwe. Hallelujah. <laughs> anyways, um, these women, all of them, some way, somehow, have experienced trauma. Some of them were beaten during the war. Some of them, um, there was this particular woman who had her eye um, shot in the war. So, I mean, like, the gunman literally put the gun at her eye and, 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 and pushed the gun in her eye because she was crying her husband had been killed in front of her. So um, all of these different stories and experiences that they have, there's an interesting thing that they do for each other as immigrants here living in Minnesota. Every other weekend, or at least once a month, they would gather and they would meet. There would be like 20 or more women in this crowded, low-income home, which was one of the homes that my grandmother lived in also. So, um, um, and when she, and when they would come, they would come bringing food and they would come telling each other um, of their experiences of not getting, knowing how to get on the bus, or all of those things about not knowing how to go downtown to get their papers filled out. Some of them want to go back home, but they can't go home because some of the health services and some of the things that they have, um, they don't have that privilege that the um, system, American system has afforded them. So they come and share their experiences and stuff like that. And, because, and, and my grandmother um, uh, being part of that experience, even here, running away from war and then coming here and having to deal with the snow. <laughs> she fell in the snow one of the winters and she had a head injury. So there was a lot of work that I did based off of that experience. So um, on the far left side, I don't know if it's really, I'm just sure that the, the, the passage from Liberia is the third pan, first panel, second panel is the Ivory Coast. And then there's another panel that's not showing, which is um, from um, the uh, from Minnesota here. And then usually the work will have like these fragmented phrases, which will be uh, uh, text written, handwritten onto the wall. And then again, the, the there was a, a, a luggage, a containment of you know, things, whatever they had that they could. Talk, tell me or had a story to tell, we will put it in a bag and then that bag will be, oh, I'm going the wrong direction again. And that bag will tell um, something about their experience. And then there was a video monitor that each of them was telling the, um, about their experience of the war in the show. Again, um, another experience that we talk about was the show at the Obsidian Art body bowls talking about bodies and how the, the, the things that we consume make us who we are, the, our traumas, our, our, our experiences. Um, sometimes you can either embrace the experiences and make yourself a better person or the experiences can define you as a person. 
and 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 you just have to be able to be positive all the time. That was part of what that was about. The the body bowls was about. Am I going in the right direction again? Okay, there's more details. And then uh, it's hard to see, but this pen, uh, this um, uh, cook in the. Um, cook place in the other machine, there was a machine there Well, you had to have permission, like a visa, an entry uh, slip that said visa denied or visa uh, accepted in order to enter into that space to see the video that was playing in there because that kind of gave you the idea that as immigrants we have to go through that uh, um, having to, to um, make sure that we have that visa to come here and you can be denied or you can be accepted. And lastly, I just wanted to please let me read the poem that, came, that comes from some of the words that go around the room that we have. Um, the, it says, this is me, this is, uh, this is you. This is anyone's circumstance. We come, to, we come face to face with uh, disastrous traumas that shift our lives self-inflicted traumas, man-made trauma, and natural traumas, a flood destroying homes, leaving one unshielded, a barren to the land, a death in the family because its memory is striving to defend a country, a rebel in the name of freedom destroying innocent lives and causing families to stay separate long after he quits his, uh, his quest is complete. Simpler yet, a fall on ice causing a flicker in one's brain due to the brief impact here, life shifts to new consciousness, an urge to make a fresh start, you make a, to make a new you, uh, makes you want to change your identity, nationality, and perhaps deny your country of birth. When or oh when will all the trauma stop? We do not know and cannot undo the past. One thing we do know is deep down we all have an inner strength ready and, uh, ready and waiting to be unburied waiting to carry us through each step to recovery, a strength that when we embrace, our lives would unfold to where we once were and perhaps strive to be. Thank you. So now before we open it up to you, we really want to get into the mix, into the meat of what we're here to talk about. And so I, I want to start by throwing out a question as a devil's advocate. We all know that there is a greater community out there that would much rather give their money to a new ballpark than spend on art. So, that said, if I've listened to everything that you said about trauma, community, healing, what would not make me say that this is all a short-term fix? How does this go forward and help a community? They drew a picture, they explained the trauma, they feel better for a little bit. How does this help? Um, Go ahead, anybody jump in. Okay. From my experience, well, um, it's a long process. You have to be consistent about even helping the community that you're making the art about. It, you cannot just want to make the art because it's for the moment. It's, for me, it's an ongoing process. The women still gather, so every now and then we will compile things for them, whether it's soap or whether it's toothbrushes or whatever they need to, to help them strive because like some, they're not working, they're not able to work anymore. They're, they're really reliant on public assistance. Mm -hmm. So with the limited um, things that they have, just to keep them positive, you just, you, you just have to stay consistent in however way possible. Sometimes you have to use your own funds. Sometimes you have to ask the other people, members in your community to reach out to them. Sometimes it just, it's just an ongoing process. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say in, in my work with uh, all, the, all the various populations I work with from developmental disabilities to grief issues to um, I work with adults, currently with adults with persistent mental illness and uh, art and writing and the arts gives gives the people the ability to heal themselves and to continue to heal themselves and with trauma you don't always have words for your feelings you may not know where you're going with your identity your soul but the art and the writing gives you messages and helps you helps you go forward I think that um, any place or city that doesn't really reflect all of the people in the city can never really be whole. And so certainly um, 
photographically, we are inundated by photographs every day, Hollywood, marketing, the media, and so on, that really don't reflect who we are as Minnesotans or as Americans. And um, the people who make those images are a very small group of people. So I think that we live in a culture where um, everyone hides themselves. And we have a public face and a private face. And it's very difficult for people to um, we live in a culture of otherness. So how do we bridge that? So to have um, a culture that really reflects us is very important. And we are far from that. So the question is, isn't this just a temporary fix? And the answer is yes, but everything else is less than that. Um, I, I think I remember looking at a cave painting when I was a little girl and thinking only in this moment that, gosh darn it, that probably preceded baseball. And so <laughs> people have been struggling to try to find ways to visually express themselves since the day after people were created. As soon as they figured out that there was plenty of food in the garden, I bet they were thinking, I wonder if I can smash this plum and make some paint with it. So it's, it's the self-expression part of the work. But as old as painting is, one second before or after that probably came the first trauma. And so, with microaggressions in contemporary society versus Jake the caveman just got his leg bit off by an anachronistic saber-toothed tiger, there will always be challenges. And so, I think we hobble together this quilt of human experiences that fits very nicely into the concept of the arts. You hit the head on the word, you, just, you said the word challenges. So what are the challenges that you face in this, this work that you do? I mean, I, I'm sure it's financial, emotional, uh, community-based. What are the challenges that you face as artists trying to help people heal with people who don't really see the value financially, that art is not necessarily something that we need. We need money, not art. You know, there's always an argument. Yeah, there is. Um, I, I want to pause for a minute and actually think about the work that each one of the people on this panel has presented here and recognize that it is somewhere between simple visual arts and therapy that is passed on to someone as a tool that they can use at the darkest moments in their lives. I am forever going to be passionate about the arts because when the unthinkable happened to me, it wasn't a therapist that saved me. It wasn't all of the friends who came to help me, but it was a moment when I realized that while I felt like I had lost control of everything, I had control of one thing, and that was my story. So I could sit down and I could tell my story, and then I could read it and tear it up if I wanted to, or I could read it with 100 other people and help them to figure out how they could tell their story. And so it, it, it is sort of that critical thing that's missing from any conversation that doesn't get it, that it isn't just about the art that hangs on the wall in museums and galleries. That's a powerful thing. But it is about equipping the people of our society with the ability to recognize the artist that's within them. And so during the times when things are unbearable, when gun violence takes someone you care about, when your house is destroyed in a tornado, even in the moments when you are quaking from mental illness, you are still an artist and you have this gift that you can give. Please feel, jump right in because this is really a dialogue between can, the, the, can, all of you. So I, just don't wait. Just if you feel I can say something about, about art in. therapy. Um, so art therapy is very process based. It's um, it can be two things. It could be art as therapy because we all you know from creating art. There's a stress release. There's relaxation. There's um, there's all those things. And then art as psychotherapy. It's developing a relationship between. Uh, the therapist and the person, between uh, people in a group surrounding the art process, the art object. It's not necessarily about the finished pro product, although some very nice things comes out of it. It's about the self-expression. It's about using um, the art as, 
as a way of expressing yourself and talking about yourselves and revealing message to yourself that you, you may not may not even know. And so I'm always talking about process and challenge would be really getting people to open up about that. Um, this previous weekend I worked with women who'd been um, sexually abused and um, it's about four or five women and um, in, in the group there were some master painters and just getting people to open up to this just process based just here's a concept just get messy and just express yourselves and it was they were all just really responsive to it um, it's allowing that opening and allowing yourself to be free and um, not think you're not a good artist I think one one thing that we, we should honestly admit as artists is if you are going into art because you want to be successful or you want to have the money, you're in the wrong career. You need to be passionate about what you're doing. You need to know, be able to understand your content. You need to understand what you're working and, and what you're making work about. And um, without healing, per se, in art, I don't understand how art can be because that the experience of just making or even dialoguing with somebody else uh, who had another experience allows you to put yourself in that person's shoe. And then together you guys can both relate to that experience and it's healing for you, it's healing for them, and it's able to help them to be able to not keep that baggage within themselves, they're able to talk about it, their experience, and you're just articulating, you're just the voice for them. Like as for my community and the women, I'm just the voice, I was just the voice for them to, to be heard about their experiences of the war and the, what they shared with me probably would not have been talked about if I, I didn't have the opportunity to, to, to listen and to make art about it, you know. So I, I, I really feel like art is, our art, like the heart art about healing is not the uh, monetary value, but is more of a humanitarian, uh, um, uh, uh, humanitarian reception of what you're experiencing when you interact with the other in making the work in the process. Yeah, I think of what I do is uh, I'm collecting uh, photographic points of view. And so I've interacted with thousands of strangers. Now, in my private life, I'm not that friendly. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm not unfriendly, but I'm like most people. I wouldn't walk up to a stranger and, and ask to photograph them and uh, ask to hear the story of their life. But this is what I do uh, as a photographer. And so, um, you know, I've been through therapy, and I, I realize, you know, talking is good. But, but it's, a, it's a certain kind of talking that's good, where you can really feel like you can, you can um, be yourself. And so um, I think uh, it's difficult for people to do that, especially uh, with social media. Um, young people will, will um, text, and uh, so they're used to having um, idealized and superficial conversations. It's very difficult to have a face-to-face -face conversation, uh, even with people you know. But with people you don't know, it's very, very awkward. And so um, I had a student who said that, um, he was a sixth grader. He came up to me after we did a chalk talk and he said, do you think that if I write, you can be a little, you can be uh, happy and a little sad? I said, oh, that's great. I said, why did why'd you write that? He said, because um, my mom died. And then he started crying. So this is a chalk talk they had with another student. And so, um, you know, to be able to uh, have a real conversation with someone, how important uh, is that? Um, and how often do we really do that in our, in our PC um, technological society? I, I just wanted to read a quick quote. It makes sense to what's been said. I didn't write it, but it's one of my favorites about what art does um, and how you listen through the art. But um, deep listening is miraculous for both listener and speaker. When someone receives us with, 
When someone receives us with open-hearted, non-judging, intensely interested listening, our spirits, our soul, and our true self expand. We're going to have questions in just a minute. We're going to finish up our panel discussion, then we'll open it up to, to the audience. With that said, you're all really doing therapeutic work when you're working with people that have experienced trauma, communities that have trauma. There's a psychic echo that happens. So how do you protect yourself from having additional trauma placed on you from the trauma that you're witnessing and then testifying about? How do you protect yourself? How do you care for yourself? If you're being witness to trauma and helping people through trauma in, with art, how do you go back to that art and use it yourself? And does the art that's produced, is it part of their trauma and your trauma then? May I say, um, I think it's both our trauma. For me, because I experienced the war, it also was able to help me as an artist. And then when having that opportunity to talk about it, even help me in my own personal writing about my own traumas, my own life, and my own experience in making work that is um, related to art and the experience of trauma as it uh, impacts the art, art uh, that we make. I, I really think that um, you can separate yourself you really can't. Mm -hmm. I found it very difficult. You, there, there is just something about the, 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 the things that you hear or the things that you've experienced. It, it, what helps is knowing that I share this experience with somebody else and I can be able to relate to that person. I can encourage the person and say, hey, I went through this experience and this is where I am now. I know that you too can be able to come out of this, you know, mm -hmm. if only you just keep holding on. You know, it's just that idea of positive reinforcement in order to help yourself to look past what was seemingly ugly you know, and, 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 and see a brighter future for yourself or that, um, or separation from that experience. Mm -hmm. Alana? Yeah. Well, for me, the, the power and came from, had one on domestic violence. And the domestic violence one I thought was going to crush me. Was that your breakthrough moment for you? It was. Yeah. It really was. So in the, in the session, I, I knew that it was going to be traumatic for people, whether it was their own pain or family pain or even a friend or a neighbor's pain. And so the first thing that I asked them to do was to write a grocery list. And they looked at me like, what? Mm -hmm. I said, write a grocery list as if you were a person experienced domestic violence and write the grocery list as if you were yourself. And so how might that change the things that you were purchased? And then I gave them permission to use the exercise as a chance to, to purchase fanciful things that you can't actually purchase in the grocery store, like courage, like strength, like gas money, like the confidence that your kids will still have shoes when they outgrow the pair that they have. And so that's what I mean about the trauma. It is painful when it first comes out. But when you recognize that you've just created a grocery list, you've given yourself permission to grieve for the difficult things that you have left behind because you have left them behind. And now that you have claimed that experience, now that you have given these words to these things that were frightening to you before, you now have this inner strength and this newfound power that you didn't have before. How could that be traumatic? It is healing. Mm. I am. Um I'm lucky enough to own one of Wing's pieces, and so I'm speaking specifically to, to you. And one of the pieces I, I bought was uh, from your Lake Street USA series. And when I see this piece, it just gives me such joy every time I see it. It's a young boy, maybe about eight, nine years old, at night by himself. You know, it's dark, it's late, he probably shouldn't be by himself. But he, performs his dance, he does his Michael Jackson routine, standing on top of the bank machines, mm -hmm. and like a Wells Fargo drive through machine. ATM machine, and there's a, sp a light that becomes a spotlight. Mm -hmm. And from nothing, cr 
creativity is born. And I, I see time and time again your images going to communities that repeatedly suffer distress, that mental illness is not addressed, that the day-to-day -day traumas of life, being without, not having money, tornadoes, poverty, everything you can think in communities that oftentimes people of color, we have double what happens in the general community. So my question to you, seeing this young boy turn joy into nothing, can trauma facilitate creativity? That's a, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I think that um, with all the people, the students I work with or the people I photograph, I don't really know their circumstances. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what is, um, what is trauma. But what I do uh, feel that there's a commonality is that um, there's a deep disconnection. Uh, a disconnection um, in all different kinds of ways. And so I think that it's very difficult to have empathy if your guard is up, mm -hmm. and if you're, if uh, if you we look at each other based on um, our perceptions, and our perceptions are driven by um, popular culture and images, uh, then it's difficult to really get to know someone, and your circle becomes very small. And so I, I, I feel that. Um, and I'm the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I think that um, it's just difficult to have conversations, real conversations. Mm -hmm. And so I think, but it's, it's the most human thing to want to do, um, no matter what you know, darkness you're coming from. So, um, and I, so I, I think that it's, it's um, photography is very accessible uh, a way to do that. But um, probably the best comment I've ever received was from a sixth grader. And he said, I really like your pictures. Well, that's yeah. great. Well, what do you like about them? He says, because they're real. I said, don't you ever see photographs that are real? And he says, no. Sixth grader. He lives in a culture where he, all the photographs he sees are not real. And his generation has seen more photographs than any other generation in the history of the world. Does that tell you about what is real mm -hmm. and how do we deal with all of this falseness? How does everybody else feel about that question? Again, the question is, does trauma facilitate creativity? Yeah, I do. Um, when we were in the Ivory Coast, we were, um, there was a time frame where Every single day, I would go from in the morning into the studio. It was like a little space that was next to the little house we had. And then in, in that studio, I would go from in the morning, I would go until night, and sometimes I would sleep three days in a row. Sometimes just coming out once without getting, uh, just to get maybe a little bit of water or so, but literally be fasting in that space, but fasting on art, making art. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was just one of those, it was those moments where it was like healing. It was like you can't, be, you wouldn't go outside and be, see the, uh, it was my escape from seeing the other mothers or children or who were, um, not able to, you know, like we're not able to have what you could have or, um, you know, other refugee ch children. You know, it was just a, um, a skip from the, the, the outside world of what my experience was at the time. Mm -hmm. So it, it was really gratifying. So mm -hmm. I think it can, it can be a positive, really positive thing. Yes. It, it can be a means of survival for survival. Some, of the, yes. some of the adults I work with, persistent mental illness, they um, would otherwise be isolated in their homes and feel stigma or their first identity is their mental illness. And now um, we have a great art studio. I work at Bridgeview Community Center in Fridley. But um, 
their first identity is artists, and they literally, all of them speak of it as being a, a means of survival. And in my own life and lives of many people, it's when there's no words, it's just, you know, you're, I don't know, forced to create or compelled to create, and I've seen it over and over again. Go ahead, Mark. Um, I guess I'll, I'll have to quote my grandmother here. When, when I was a little girl, there was a pair of very fancy, very expensive shoes that I wanted. And so my grandmother, being very frugal, shopped around and discovered that there was a pair that had been returned at a store downtown. And they were the right color, but they were not the right size. And so she negotiated with me, and we bought them anyway, and they hurt. And every time I complained, she said, suffering builds character. <laughs> so, so my response that I would never speak to my grandmother was, yes, but. So certainly traumatic experiences can build creativity. Certainly traumatic experiences can help us to tap into parts of ourselves that we may not have known were there before. But I'm pretty sure that for most of us, it's not our first choice at finding our inner self. So um, what I would like to help people figure out is how they can take little tiny traumatic experiences mm -hmm. and ride those like all the waves on the California shores to find their creativity and not wait for the most painful things that will come along because there are stages to recovering from traumatic experiences and the first stage has little to do with creativity. It has to do with numbness, with pain, with extreme discomfort and a lack of awareness of yourself and those around you. And so what a journey to have to go on to come back and find that creativity later. Just like the shoes, I'm, I'm not sure it's worth it. Mm -hmm. Now here's a, here's um, a, okay. Please go ahead and then I'll give you my example. Well, if everyone were happy and well adjusted, I'm wondering how much art there would be. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You'd have a lot of pretty flowers and ponies and things like that in the, the classic book. But the reason I ask that question is because it, it also comes up from a different angle. I, I know of a very well known, internationally known artist that is from this community whose work is based on his brother's schizophrenia. So what he considers himself doing is translating his brother's feelings, emotions, what happens when he goes through it. And people buy the work, but they don't understand the trauma. But the trauma is facilitated through creativity. And it's just what this man sees as what he says his brother describes to him. So I asked that question from two different perspectives. You know, is it therapeutic, but it also does it lend itself to creativity? That trauma lend to other people's creativity. Thank you so much, panelists. Now uh, I think the audience is very, very eager to ask questions. We have two staff members from U Rock that will be walking around with microphones. Please raise your hand, and I will try my best from up here to point out who has their hands up. Uh, please do not ask long follow-up questions. Make your questions pretty succinct. This lady has been very eager here in the lovely teal pants, so we're gonna start with you. Just when you asked about, when you asked about um, additional trauma to the artist or therapist based on what you share in someone else's experience. Mm -hmm. I, just, I, I worked at one time in the battered women's movement and people would always ask, you know, how can you bear it? Well, it's really very positive because by the time you are interacting with that person, they are at that stage in their journey. Very positive steps. So yes, you're, you're exposed to, you know, the, the facts of their experience, but it's at a, such a positive stage. So I wanted to comment on that, and then I just wanted to also say um, that, uh, what did I want to say? I forgot to. Uh, you know what, we're going to come back to you. Very if good. If you a question, we'll ask somebody else, but try to remember, and put you, please put your hand back up, we'll come back to you. There's a lady over here, please. Um, I feel like in this country, and I don't know how it is in other countries, that there's a great deal of stigma associated with most of the things that traumatize us. Even if you lose your home in a tornado, then you're homeless. And there's a great deal of stigma attached to that, let alone domestic violence that people don't want to talk about. 
And I wonder if any of you like would talk about like destigmatizing trauma in the creative process. If, if I'd be curious to hear if, if you feel like shame is part of it, and then when you do something creative, the shame is less. Is that is that ever something that is on your mind? It's a good question. Thank you. You know, I think one of the things that people in the United States value more than anything else is getting something from something. And so even at the moments when people are experiencing some of the worst traumas, they suddenly start to feel better when you tell them that they can get something from it. So in the middle of being homeless, if someone were to walk up to you and say, but you can write about this, and it's gonna be a great story to tell your grandkids. Believe it or not, although they don't have a roof over their head yet, they're now starting to figure out how they can move past that experience. It, it may be a tool that therapists use, I don't know, um, but it is the ability to visualize yourself beyond that place, I think that, that makes all the difference in the world. If we are forced to simply stay in the state of I lost my home, I lost my home, then yes, it's, it's painful and there's nothing else to tell. But as soon as we give someone the realization that you will move past this, then it allows them to believe in the journey and begin to carve out the map that's going to be their path. This side, this gentleman here. I'm having a pro real problem. Not, I've now accepted the notion that everyone could be an artist. And perhaps that's a foolish notion. There are doctors, there's lawyers, and then there are television commentators who can become great artists. But not everyone can. Most of us can have trauma. What concerns me is the systemic lack of equity in the training of the arts. And if art truly can heal, given the trauma in certain communities, the lack of art in the public schools, we know it went away. I mean, I know what goes on at Southwest versus because it's in North and Henry I know what goes on at what that high school and then it's our in arts versus that. I know you can't get a gospel choir in North Minneapolis, but you can have a symphony in other schools. It seems to me what the artist artist is always from my perspective, and I recognize I've got some years on most people in this room. Artists always reflected what was going on in the society. And I see somehow we can reflect the inequities that go on in this society, we will do a great service to attacking the system's problem. And the system problem, like everything else, Du Bois pointed out, it is the lack of equity. It's no longer just the lack of equity for black people, but for other people of color. It is also the 99% versus the 1%. So if we're gonna be honest, and face this problem, the artists have to reflect it in ways in which I have no idea. I couldn't draw a straight line with a T-square, okay? <laughs> but I can write and I can speak fairly well. Thank you. Thank you. That was profound. So, I mean, it, it's, it's not gonna take four people on a panel to come up with that, but let's talk about that. I mean. Let's talk about the inequities in the public schools that allow, uh, that keep our children from measuring up to statistical standards of what they need to proceed, to excel. Uh, do we mandate from the governor that arts, just like affordable health care, need to be mandatory in the schools in order for children to get that much ability to express what inner problems, home problems may be going on. What do we do? Do, do we pr approach this that like this is medicine? It's a must in our community for our children to have arts? Well, I'm not so familiar with the American society, but I believe from just 
my understanding of the society that it should be amended. The only reason why I'm saying that um, it's been proven that artists or creativity enhances the, the, the way in which somebody thinks and the way in, they interact with the, with, the, with the world at large. So if you were um, not given that opportunity to be creative as a child or within the school system, you're, you're, you're being denied that, 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 that gift or, or opportunity to be able to, to think or process like an um, a artist would. You may not be an artist, but the fact that you experience some sort of training as an artist or a prospective artist, it will just help to make you think better or you know, like look at things better or, or even um, how that curtain is open, you can notice that versus somebody who didn't really care why it was open. Great question. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Yeah, I wanted to talk about, just for a second, about why art is important. So the commenter said we have physicians and we have baseball players and we have police officers and we have mothers and fathers. And so the ability to be able to realistically render may not be the most valuable tool in, in their arsenal. But when it comes to the ability to be able to recognize shapes and the way that it, you train the brain to be able to process the difference between light and dark and colors um, and to know what happens when you mix certain pigments, those things branch off into science. Those things branch off into law and technology. And one of the greatest surgeons alive today talked about how he used to doodle really fine drawings in a notebook as a child, and it sort of honed his ability to be able to now handle a scalpel. So, so just like the arts can be a tool in recovering from trauma, they're also a critical component of brain development. And so just like it doesn't make sense to eliminate recess in schools where children are performing poorly, because recess is a critical part of, of childhood experience as well, it doesn't make sense to eliminate arts in schools where children are performing poorly academically, because that isn't the tool that changes it for them. It's having access to those things, because some children respond positively to, to the pure form of math as an art, but other children may find their connection to the arts and the sciences through English, mm -hmm. through drawing, through chemistry. And so you simply can't throw one part of the, of the experience away in the hopes that the other experiences will be enhanced by that. And sir, I do challenge you. I do believe there is art in every walk of life. <laughs> Everything from listening to your grandmother tell a story to the art of doing laundry, <laughs> there is an art to everything in life. We just have not been taught to appreciate the beauty and the symmetry and the rhythm and the rhyme and the pattern to every aspect of our lives. But we all have something we can do. That is the truth. That is the truth. Uh, um, I, I, agree, I agree with you and I, I, I agree with this gentleman. Um, but part of the problem is that um, our cultural idea of art is driven by museums. And the museums are driven by money. The major museums are like the Smith Barneys, the 1%. And so um, our culture of art is very white. It's very wealthy. And so um, if we put that money into art in schools, but I think that's changing. The, uh, the major institutions, I think, um, I think more com community-based arts are, are becoming more of a model. So. We have time for one more question. And this uh, young lady, she, she had, you had a question. But you know what I'm going to do? Because we're going to make it fast. I'm going to combine three questions at once. So you, you get to answer the first one, second one, and third one. And then we're going to wrap them all into one and be done, OK? So you get to ask the first part then hand the microphone to this lady, then hand the microphone to that lady. We're going to get all these questions at once. I'm going to follow instructions poorly because I'm not sure if I had a question, but I've been sitting here on the edge of my seat because this has been an experience of 
like art, creating art together, this has been a conversation that I'm like, oh, I just, I want to jump into this. I want to say <laughs> stuff. You're asking questions like, is art a Band-Aid? And it's like, oh, oh my goodness, the thought of art being a Band-Aid, you know, how can art have long-lasting effects? When you think about, well, I'm going to open a neighborhood clinic and I'm going to treat somebody for a drop of what they fully need for one day, that is where the drop is. But when you have art and you create a symbol for someone to take and carry within them, that can have healing effects for years, for decades, for centuries, I would put out there. And um, this, this thing of can uh, trauma facilitate creativity? I, I couldn't bite it off. I went, I went, I went yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went, wait, 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 wait. Because um, the thought that was coming to me was, you know, from trauma, yes, creativity rises out. But I think it's that experience of rising up and stretching and reaching beyond the trauma, what trauma invites us to do in response to it, that um, forcement, that, that, I can't think of it in English, <laughs> that requires of us that we must bring forth our creativity. Right. And it has been such an honor to be in the presence of this, of everyone who has come to this conversation today. And so I just, I couldn't sit on my seat any longer. And I didn't Thank listen you. to instructions, and I just jumped on here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Right on next to the other way right there. Thank you. And we all need to take a clue from our very thrifty ancestors who did patchwork and paper mache. And yes, there are terrible disparities in the funding for art programs but everyone can come up with a pencil or a ballpoint pen and any kind of paper at all and encourage that in the home. And then if a, if a child can gather that he or she can create something of value, their whole attitude toward their own value is transformed forevermore. And the thing I wanted to share earlier was uh, there was a, a Dr. Jane Gelgon at the University of Minnesota School of Social Work who was interested in how do we interrupt a cycle of violence. Uh, there was the idea that, you know, you live with violence and then you're going to, you know, perpetrate. But if everyone who has suffered violence perpetrated, everybody would be doing it. She wanted to know what interferes with that. And her research. Uh, showed that the one factor seems to be having expressed it to someone. Now, that could be a verbal expression, but if you're trying to discuss the unspeakable, maybe you do that in the arts somehow as a step towards that other level of expression. So, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And finally. Uh, last question. How, we, how do we follow you? Do you have Twitter or Facebook? <laughs> Facebook <laughs> for me. Okay. Uh, Facebook. Facebook. Uh, Facebook and Twitter, because awesome. I am the future. <laughs> With that, we're going to wrap up our program. I am so delighted. So many people came and had so many thoughtful things to say. Please give another round of applause to our panelists. For being